I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you're all losing your homes. And oh, don't think you are getting out of this one because your mortgage is paid off. No. We're dealing with a force more ruthless than banks or lending institutions. Climate change, they call it. Climate change caused by increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane has been responsible for the extreme weather events around the globe, including that super chilly winter we just had. Cost of climate change in Canada alone is rising from $5 billion annually to $21 billion. Now that you know the culprit, let me present to you my natural solution. My research is lobbying for the preservation of one of nature's superheroes, peatlands. You might know them as peat bogs or that gross swamp you thread through during summer camps. Peatlands are swampy areas with low oxygen, leading to slow decay of dead plants and animals, which is a good thing because it leads to carbon being stored for thousands of years, contributing to the cooling of the planet. Undisturbed pristine peatlands, like the one here, can store five to 20 times more carbon than forest, making them the best carbon sinks. Unfortunately, disturbance by man, you and me, can change them into carbon sources. Oil sand deposits located in peatlands in areas like Alberta has led to the creation of over 350,000 kilometers of roads or linear disturbances for oil exploration projects such as the Keystone and the TransCanada. Unfortunately, the impact of these roads on peatland function is understudied, leading to uncertainty in their carbon storage function. My research is measuring carbon accumulation potential in disturbed peatlands and monitoring changes to provide policymakers to justify limited or no exploration activities in these high risk areas. Current results from my lab indicate an increase in the production of methane gas from disturbed areas. Methane is 28 times more potent in trapping heat compared to carbon dioxide. This is changing our peatlands into supervillains. At this point, how many of you still agree we should continue invading peatlands for oil sands? Remember, ignorance about climate change doesn't take away the effect. Of course, the clock is ticking and we have only one home. And oh, I left Trump up there because at the end of my research, he'd be one of the climate change skeptics who would have to join me or relocate to a new planet. I would say, for Pete's sake, let the peatlands be. Thank you. Franklin Roosevelt once said, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. Forests are the lungs of the land, purifying the air and giving strength to its people. They cover about 30% of the Earth's land surface while accounting for 50% of plant productivity. Why am I even talking about forests when we live in such beautiful edifice? Well, I'll tell you why. They cool the air, they control the movement of water, they anchor the soil, and most importantly, they control the Earth's carbon budget. Do you know that about 4 billion out of the 9 billion carbon emissions annually, representing 45%, are absorbed into forests, telling us how important forests are to the purification of air we breathe? But do you also know that between the year 2000 and 2010, approximately 1.3 million square kilometers of forest land have been depleted? And this number is only expected to hit 2.9 million square kilometers by 2050. Frightening enough. When the last tree dies, the last man will die. That is where the passion of my research comes in. To be able to save the future of the forest, governments, organizations, and communities worldwide are collaborating to create a network of forest protected areas. A forest protected area is any piece of land that contains a substantial amount of forest where human activities are restricted for conservation purposes. In Ghana, where my research is focused, Population-induced pressures, weak institutions, and then the desire for industrialization have subjected the forest cover to depletion. Over the last century alone, about 80% of the country's forest cover have been depleted. In most developing countries, the major problem is a lack of compliance on the part of community members, especially when they feel left out of the project. So the question is, how can we get the local communities to participate in forest conservation? I believe that my project will use the ecotourism community-based approach. This approach is a bottom-up approach that has three pillars, environmental conservation, respect for local culture and participation, and most importantly, provision of livelihood for these people. I believe it's just a starting point of understanding the needs of these local people and telling, telling resources to satisfy their needs. Also, 
I hope to engage the local people to answer three questions. One, what are the benefits they get from this forest? Two, how does restricted access to these forests affect their benefits? And three, how can we reduce deforestation at the same time ensuring food and livelihood support and security? I believe that if all stakeholders can answer these questions very well, we will better understand the needs of these local communities, and then the government of Ghana will be able to tailor its limited resources to satisfying these needs, at the same time ensuring environmental conservation. That is just a win-win situation. And so eventually, what do you think? I believe that the last man will not die. Do you know why? Because he will not cut the last tree. Rather, he will plant another one. Thank you. Have you ever wondered where the term scot-free came from and what it has to do with flood risk management? Well, today is your lucky day. The word scot is actually derived from an old Scandinavian word meaning tax. This expression can be traced back to 12th century England where communities living on a floodplain were required by t law to pay a flood tax in order to fund flood protection, while communities living away from the plain did not have to pay this tax and were considered to be scot-free. Now this expression is interesting to think about for two reasons. First, it indicates that flooding and its associated risks are an ever-present problem. And secondly, it reminds us that flooding occurs in cities all over the world. The traditional hazard-based approach to flood risk, sorry, the traditional hazard-based approach to flood management only seeks to contain and control water through the use of flood defenses, such as dikes or dams. However, this approach only addresses a small portion of a city's flood risk. It cannot incorporate the uncertainty generated by climate change. It puts the burden of flood protection solely on the city, and it fails, typically in urban areas. However, many cities continue to use this method. An alternative approach is a flood risk management perspective. <clears throat> As you can see on the slides, flood risk management works with the community to integrate uncertainty and to share flood risk. One way of sharing risk is through the use of financial policy tools. These tools are widely used in a variety of many different areas, such as economics, like financial markets, and insurance. However, there's been little research on how these tools actually impact flood risk. My research will look at how modern scots, so taxes, user fees, and credit programs are used within large Canadian cities. By distributing surveys and undertaking policy analysis, my research will provide additional insight into how cities perceive risk, respond to flooding, and whether or not these policy tools actually positively influence the flood risk. In turn, my research can be used by municipalities to develop more adaptive flood management policies and hopefully encourage the uptake of the flood risk management approach. So why should you care about my research? I'll give you three reasons. First, flooding costs money. It's very expensive and you can't get away scot-free. So you must decide, are you going to pay a little now or a lot later? Secondly, the city can't prevent flooding itself. It needs the residents, it needs us to help with the flood pre prevention and risk sharing. Finally, flooding is a global issue, but the solution is local. When you pay your scots, you're not merely paying for the service, but you're paying for your community's future. Thank you. <laughs> 